A friend told me the story, it's probably the same all over Australia, that he went to work on a Monday morning and there was a car parked across his driveway going into his business. And so he couldn't get any cars, it was actually a car repair yard. So he couldn't get any cars coming in, he couldn't get any cars coming out and the car was blocking his entryway totally. So he called the local council and they said we'll put a sticker on it. I said, a sticker is not enough, I need to move it. He said, no, according to the law, we put a sticker on it and if it hasn't been moved in seven days, then we're legally allowed to move it. <laughs> said, seven days! My business will go broke in seven days. He said, well, that's the council regulations, we can't move it. Okay, he said. So he got in his car and he parked it across the entranceway into the council officer's car park. <laughs> and when they said, move it, he said, put a sticker on it. <laughs> <laughs> and in a couple of hours, the car in front of his driveway was moved, and then he moved his own car. <laughs> That's the way to deal with councils sometimes. <laughs> it's really smart. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we'll start with uh, meditation again today. Now remember what I told you yesterday? Well first of all, you see just uh, how meditation should be a happy process. And I mentioned yesterday the Dhammadaya Sutta, no Dhammachetya Sutta, that where that, uh, the king noticed that the monks meditating under the Buddha were always happy and smiling. And that's always a very good sign. Because if you really do let go, what are you letting go of anyway? you're letting go of dukkha, of suffering. And the more you let go, the less suffering you have, the happier you should be. So a really good sign that the meditation is going in the correct direction is you become happier, lighter, don't carry so many burdens in life. You know, someone calls you an idiot and you just smile at them and laugh and then that's really funny. And whatever it is, you become very light-hearted. And the, and the best meaning of the word, I mean, easy to smile, easy to laugh, but also just you don't carry around the burdens of the past, and you don't worry about the future either. You know, I've always noticed that you know, when, I, when I don't plan for the future, and often I don't plan for the future, you know, things go wrong. You know, you need to plan, otherwise you don't know what's going to happen. So if I don't plan for the future, things go wrong. But when I do plan for the future, they go wrong anyway. <laughs> Either way, <laughs> the future goes wrong. So I decide not to plan and enjoy it before it goes wrong. That's my motto in life. <laughs> Expect things to go wrong and don't plan so you can enjoy everything. And which means you become quite light-hearted. You don't worry so much, you can let go more. And imagine, just imagine what it must be like to be a Buddha, to be enlightened. All the past which happened to you, you can just let go like that and you can laugh at your mistakes. That's what I learned from Ajahn Chah, whenever I made a mistake, he would just laugh. He would never punish you or scold you or shout at you. He'd think it was so funny when Westerners made mistakes. <laughs> Just like the first time we'd all go onto the Asian toilets. You know, just a squat toilet. Where's a toilet? That's a toilet. So you know what we'd do? We'd sit on it. <laughs> Put your bottom right down on it. I think, well, is this what I'm supposed to do? <laughs> That's me. Or like, you know, the spittoons we sometimes have. You know, we always have spittoons next year. You know, one of the the person started to become a monk, thought this was his bowl and put his rice in his cup. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great when you make mistakes because you share it out, let everybody laugh. And I love sharing my mistakes around. <laughs> One of the mistakes which has become quite famous now is uh, <laughs> when I'm doing a marriage ceremony for a couple. Now this is an important note. The marriage, the happiest day of a couple's life. They prepare that in Australia now, you prepare that for about a year or two years. These couples, and they book me a year in advance because they have to book the venue, save up and buy all this stuff. It's just really expensive getting married. And it's even more expensive getting divorced, so just do it once. <laughs> Sorry, getting recycled. 
<laughs> just do it once. So it's really important. And so I don't mind just you know, giving everything I have, you know, to sort of uh, the coming together as a couple, so they have a happy life together. So I really put a lot of effort even into my marriage blessings, but this time I was tired. You know, I do a lot of stuff and you know, I'm getting old now, so it's easier to get tired, exhausted. So I went along to the wedding at the end of a busy day and I did the chanting for them and once I started the chanting I realised, oh my goodness, I'm doing the wrong chanting. <laughs> I did the funeral chant. <laughs> for this couple, <laughs> instead of the wedding blessing. Well, anyway, <laughs> they didn't know, because it's all in Pali, so you don't understand Pali. <laughs> and yet the amazing thing is that they're still happily married. <laughs> so it didn't matter anyway. But I made that mistake for them. I remember another time of doing a funeral service. It was a Sri Lankan boy in Perth. He said, you know, one of his parents had died, can I come and do the ceremony? And, you know, the parent never came to the temple, but, you know, he did. And he said, much better if you can come and do the ceremony for us. So I went there and, oh, you know, what a funeral ceremony is like. You're in the funeral chapel, everybody is wearing black and being sad. And, you know, you try and sort of have a bit of gravitas, you know, and saying to people, oh, we've come here today to celebrate the death of you know, my disciple's mother who's passed away tragically and I went on like that for one more minute and then this old lady in the front stood up and said, it's not me who's dead, it's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I got it wrong! 50-50 <laughs> chance and I chose the wrong one. And after that was one of the wonderful funerals. I really loved that funeral because you know, all the somberness, it really was a celebration. We were laughing all the way through the funeral. And even in the, the fellow in the box, I'm sure I heard it shaking with laughter as well. <laughs> so when we, make, when we make mistakes, we laugh. We have this beautiful light-heartedness in the world. Instead, when some people make mistakes, they feel really guilty, they feel ashamed. No, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I'm a terrible person. Or they go and blame other, you stupid person, you parked your car in the wrong place and you're the ex-president of the Buddhist society, you should know better. Well, 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 well. <laughs> no, you laugh at it. Which means you are light-hearted. And this is what meditation is supposed to do, to be able to let go and see the funny side of life. You know, and just uh, have joy there instead of suffering. It's not a self. You know, we all make mistakes, we're all conditioned beings, and so when there's no self in there, you don't feel so responsible anymore. It's a wonderful thing, you just let go much more. Now that's an important part. And you'll find the opposite of that, which I was focusing on yesterday, was when we try and control things and take responsibility for it, which means we struggle, we strive, we get stressed out, when we make a mistake, we think we made a mistake, it's just life making its mistake, that's all. And when we do uh, things like that, you know, we get so stressed out. That is not the way to meditate, for goodness sake. It gives meditation a bad name. <laughs> I went to one seminar somewhere, I forget where it was, and they had this uh, Professor Philippe Jospin, I think he was, from Stanford University. That's right, it was in uh, a meditation, uh, a med Tibetan meditation mindfulness dharma seminar in Sydney a few years ago. And Philip Jospin, I think his name was, from Stanford University, one of these people doing experiments in meditation and mindfulness. These days, I mean, there's so many universities in the world who are actually experimenting you know, with meditation and mindfulness and seeing the great benefits of it. So being a, a very wealthy university, Stanford, he got the funds to do this experiment. He took his psychology students, they got a credit for this. He split them into half, you know, the, uh, what's it called, the control. control group, yeah, and the other group, the victims. <laughs> 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 and for the victims, he sent them to a meditation retreat for the day, just like you're doing here. And then after they finish, he tests them out to see their relaxation, their stress levels, you know, and all that sort of stuff, to see how meditation would help them. And the other half, the other 50%, he sent to a California spa for the day. 
massages, hot oil, hot baths, to see which relaxed you more, meditation or the spa. And you have to have a big expensive university <laughs> you know, to pay the bill for a California spa for about 50, 60 students. And after they went to the spa, they gave them the same test to see how relaxed they were. That's incredible. When the results came in, the results were so clear, those who went to the spa were far more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck is going on? And it's because it was one of those meditation retreats. No, now you've got to walk, now you've got to sit, watch your breath, straight back, watch your posture, no, don't make any noise, don't fall asleep. It's one of those retreats. No wonder that caused you to be more stressed out. <laughs> but I'm sure if they did one of my retreats, then my retreat you'd be twice, ten times as relaxed as going to a spa. <laughs> because this is so important. You have to learn how to relax the body to make it healthy, obviously, and relax your mind to make it healthier, obviously. And if you're going to get peaceful and still, like I said the other day, you can't do that through force. Every time you use force, you actually disturb the mind. You agitate it. That story I said yesterday, Ajahn Chah, the leaf on a tree. That was such a powerful simile. Simple, without any need for any uh, visual aids, he just used his hand. Leaf on a tree. It only moves because of the wind. So, if you hold the leaf still, that's, that's not going to work. You just protect it from the wind. And then the leaf, moves less and less until it becomes perfectly still. That's what we do with our mind. Our mind is a leaf. And what is the wind? Every time you do something, want something, try something, you agitate it. And so sometimes people say, well, Ajahn Brahm, what about the four right efforts in Buddhism? That's number six of the Eightfold Path. What about the efforts? You're supposed to put effort in. And if you look at what the effort actually is, it's the effort to renounce, to stop, to let go. Not the effort to do things and attain things, but the effort to stop that process and just to be, to let go. I love actually trying to introduce the basic Dharma into meditation because I've noticed traditional Buddhists, they know Buddhism, they know the Dharma, and they try meditating, but the two are separate. Meditation is one thing, the Dharma is another thing, they never combine them together. And when you say the other day, the Four Noble Truths, Second Noble Truth, craving, wanting, causes suffering. Craving for anything, even craving for soul one, is going to cause you suffering, it's going to put you in the opposite direction. Craving for peace, wanting to be, get jhanas, that's going to move you in the opposite direction, that's going to stop all these things happening. And the Third Noble Truth, letting go, is the cause for the end of suffering. So if you want to be peaceful and happy, you have to let go. The Buddha said that was so clear. But one of the other factors of the Eightfold Path, which I always love focusing on in meditation retreats like today, <coughs> is the second factor of the Eightfold Path. Samasankapa, the right intention. You know, where well, everything comes from. And the right intention, the three Samasankapas, a Nekama Sankapa, a Vyapadaka Sankapa, and a Hingsaka Sankapa. Nekama, renunciation, letting go, stopping. Not meditating to gain things, but meditating to let go, to renounce everything. Renounce all your attainments. When you renounce your attainments, you're renouncing the self. Renouncing trying to get places. Renouncing all of this, uh, your past and your future renouncing just everything. It's letting go. Nekama Sankapa. And the next one, Awayapadaka Sankapa. You know, sometimes people ask me, said, well, compassion, we always know Buddhism is compassionate, but where is that in the Eightfold Path? You don't have like Sama Metta or Sama Karuna in the Eightfold Path. And you find it there, the second factor of the second uh, so the second part of the second factor of the Eightfold Path, 
a Vyapada Sankhapa. Vyapada basically means non-ill will. It is a, a synonym. Synonym means the same word expressed in a different way. A synonym for metta. Avayapada equals metta. And this is like intentions of kindness, compassion, metta. That is the second factor of the second factor of the Eightfold Path, the second part of the second factor of the Eightfold Path. It's right in there. And I was really surprised sometimes how some people forget that and they meditate with ill will. Okay, body, I've had enough with you moving, you're going to sit still. <coughs> sit still or else. This is going to be enlightenment or bust. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got one day left, okay, let's do it. And that type of attitude, I've seen that in my life as a monk, caused huge problems. There's one monk, I won't say who he is, but he lives in Northumberland in England. <laughs> you know who his name is. And when I was a young monk, he was just a tiny bit junior to me, and he decided to go for broke, to sit through pain, not moving. So it doesn't matter how much it hurt, he was just going to sit there, and sit there, and sit there, just like the Buddha. Even though my blood dries up, and my bones turn to dust, I'm not going to move until I get enlightened or die. No namby-pamby cream puff stuff for me. This is it. The tough guy. The US Marine form of meditation. <laughs> the Buddhist seals. <laughs> the BSV SWAT team. <laughs> you know, for some people, not just guys, girls as well, they really get into that, they think, yeah, this is it. This is me. I'm going to go for it. I'm tough. I'm hard. I've got enough willpower as a Buddha did. I'm Australian. I can do this. <laughs> And this poor monk, <laughs> after he came out of meditation, we had to send him to hospital for double knee reconstruction. <laughs> it's crazy! And I don't know why people actually do that. They think, you know, I think maybe you've had those thoughts sometimes. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do the tough retreats. None of this, this soft stuff which Ajahn Brahm teaches, you know, cushions. Get rid of all the cushions, come on. Get rid of all the blankets, get them away. Sit up straight, okay. No moving, not this 30 minutes or 40 minutes meditation. Let's do two hours. Let's do all day, no lunch, okay. Sit down, we're finishing at five and no one's going to move, okay. <laughs> now some people like that. And I get complaints sometimes that my retreats are too soft. But I, I'm not going to accept that, because I know exactly what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and how powerful it is. And so those sorts of people, they're forgetting the second part of the second factor of the Eightfold Path. It's intentions of kindness and gentleness. And it's weird. If you force the body and force the mind, all you're doing is strengthening your sense of self. It is. The will is what creates the self. Have you ever noticed people with big egos? In the office, politicians. I met big politicians sometimes. Oh, I remember the first time I met John Howard. It, you know, what I got from him afterwards, that this guy thinks he owns Australia. <laughs> Honestly, that was the intention, that you know, Australia was his. I met some of these other politicians. The scariest politician I've ever met was Hun Sen, you know, the Prime Minister of Cambodia. He was a really dangerous guy. <laughs> and I did meet many of your politicians, you know, in Sri Lanka. <laughs> I must admit that, that you know, Rajapaksa, you know, the, uh, the, pri the president, you know, he was quite a, a kind guy, but some of his cabinet afterwards because you know, they were having a cabinet meeting and I just finished having breakfast with your president and when I came out, these guys, whew, you could feel them, just these were, please excuse me, but bad people. They had big egos, controlling, and also corrupt as well. 
And they got to that place, they'd striven very hard. All their force, all their ego, all their effort had made them into these big fellows, big egos. And that was one of the big problems. Striving gives you a sense of achievement, which gives you a sense of ego. And this is who I am. That is not the way of Buddhism. We're actually diminishing our sense of self, diminishing our <coughs> ego. And so actually when you start to let go and be kind, you know, you tend to vanish, disappear. Your ego gets smaller and weaker and softer. So that's why every time I've noticed monks who do strive, put forth lots of effort, they become impossible to live with, frankly. And big egos, people who are successful in the world, sports personalities, TV personalities become impossible to live with also. They've got huge egos because they've succeeded. That's why if you fail in life, it's a wonderful achievement to fail. <laughs> in Buddhism, it diminishes your ego. <laughs> and that's what we're supposed to be doing. So I encourage you to fail today. <laughs> Don't achieve anything. Give up. You're hopeless. I can't do anything. And then you're getting much closer to the, to the dumb. <laughs> so that's why this striving business, you know, I've seen by example over many years meditating, being a monk for so long, and I've also understand why it doesn't work. We have to let go. Do you remember the Buddha before his enlightenment? He had this wonderful little um, bit of the, the history of the Buddha's enlightenment. He put his bowl in the river Nirangela and he said, he made a determination, if I am to become enlightened, my, my bowl go against the stream, against the current. And of course you all know in the, in the story, it did flow against the current. And he thought that was an omen. It's not just an omen, it was a, a good description of how enlightenment happens. You go against the stream of craving, which is not another type of craving. It's go against the stream of all craving. Stop, stop doing stuff. Let go. Be still. Stop. It comes into one of the lovely stories in the history of Wapa Pong. There was a young novice, maybe 12, 13 years of age, somewhere around that, that age. And one evening Ajahn Chah was giving a, a lecture, giving a talk. Now, in those days, when these monks start giving talks, they just don't stop. One hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, sometimes all night they keep going on. And you get used to that. And you would think, wow, that must be amazing, six hours of Ajahn Chah. It was not amazing. It was boring as hell. Because the truth of the matter was, and ask any monk who was there at the time, Ajahn Chah would speak a lot of rubbish most of the time. And that's my teacher, I respect him, so this is truth. But every now and again he would say something which was so powerful, so deep, it was worth it. It was like, you know, mining gold in, in Bendigo or somewhere. You dig up all this rubbish and then you find a few nuggets and that's why it's worth it. And that's what it was like with Ajahn Chah. You guys these days, when you read these books of his teachings, that has been like sifted, you know, all the rubbish pushed away, just the nice little bits have kept for you. And it's very nice, you're very lucky. <laughs> but for me, I had to sit through it all the time. But it was worth it, because every night he said, say something, wow, that's incredible. And you know, that changes your whole life, just a few nuggets of wisdom. But, you know, for a, a monk, you know, you've got some endurance, you can stay up late at night, but for a little 12 or 13 year old novice, that was too late for him. And going along 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, he's thinking, I'm not a monk, I'm a little guy, can't I go back to bed? And he started complaining and thinking. His thought, which kept on going round and round in his head, was when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? <coughs> When is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When is Ajahn Chah going to stop? And it became just repeating itself over and over and over for about an hour. When is Ajahn Chah going to stop? Ooh, when is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? <coughs> and now the wonderful thing about insight and Dhamma is where you take a phrase like that and you just turn it the other way around. 
And he turned it around. After one hour, or something like that, he said, when am I going to stop? <laughs> and he stopped. And when he opened his eyes later on, all the monks had left. It was, the d dawn had happened, it was early morning. It was light. And he had just had his first great meditation. This little thirteen-year-old. He didn't hear the monks doing the chanting when they were leaving, put away all their, their stuff, and make a noise when they leave like everybody else. He had to always do the chanting at the end, sometimes Arahang Sama Sambudo, they always do that, he hadn't heard anything. He should be sitting, having the time of his life, deep within. And the interesting part of that story was how he did it. He stopped. Now you understand how we get into these deep meditations. You don't go along with this craving or that craving, or the craving to stop craving. You stop. And then he went into this incredibly nice meditation, one of the jhanas. That gives you the key. <coughs> Just like Angulimala. Stop, monk! Chasing the Buddha, trying to kill him. And the Buddha saying, I have stopped, you stopped. But you're running, what do you mean? This is what he meant. Stop. That is why, when I've come to Melbourne, I have found it's incredible just how far Buddhist, uh, Buddhism has actually flourished in this city. Every intersection I see this Buddhist sign, the Dhamma, <laughs> stop. <laughs> I thought, wow, people here understand the way to Nibbana. <laughs> <laughs> so every time from now on you see a stop sign, remember the Buddha. Remember that little monk, remember Angulimara, stop! <laughs> but I have stopped, policeman. <laughs> no, you've gone right through the sign. No, so you stop. And that is how we understand about the second factor. The kindness, the stopping. And the kindness is what allows you to stop. Because when you're kind to your mind, the whole thing changes. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Our meditation retreats, uh, my retreat center. You know, there's always people who have a difficult time trying to meditate, trying to get so on, trying to get jhanas. Ajahn Brahm says it's really nice, better than sex and all that. I want, I want, I want, I want. And I can't do it. Ajahn Brahm, help. <laughs> so a lot of times when people come with those sorts of problems to me on a retreat, this is the advice I give them. So go to bed, have a nap. I can't have a nap, that's indulging. I'm in here for enlightenment. I can't waste any more time. Go to bed. No, no, that's just giving up. Go to bed. And I order them to go into their room and have a nap. And I tell them, after you've had a nap, have a cup of tea, chamomile tea, you know, if you're Venerable Buddha Rakata, uh, <laughs> Tim Kiri tea, if you're Ajahn Brahm, whatever have a shower, and then come and meditate. And you know, it's this 100% success rate when I give them these orders. They go and take a rest, shower, cup of tea, and then they have the most beautiful meditation of their whole retreat. And I ask them why? Because you are kind to your body and kind to your mind. It's not indulging, it's kindness. And too often, people these days are too cruel to their mind. So cool. And I'll give you another simile to emphasize this. A meditator, a woman, she gets a call one afternoon on her uh, smartphone and it's uh, an acquaintance of hers. And she said, are you free this afternoon? And you say, yeah. So I'll come out for a cup of coffee. Okay, where? I know you like going to Gloria Jean's, but I like going to Dome, so I'm going to take you to Dome coffee. And I know you like lattes, but they're bad for your health, you're going to get a short black. 
And I know that you like muffins, chocolate chip muffins, but that's also bad. You're going to have a biscuit like I'm going to have a biscuit. And I know you like sitting out the front on the veranda, but I hate that, so we're going to sit around the back. And I know you always like talking about your spirituality, Buddhism and meditation nonsense. I like talking about politics, so we're going to talk about politics. And I've got exactly one hour, so you're going to sit there for one hour with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine if you did get a, get a call like that, what would you do? Telling you what coffee shop to go in, what coffee you're going to drink, what you're going to eat, where you're going to sit, for how long, what you're going to talk about? That's a control freak. <laughs> so what you do is say, um, oh, oh, I just remembered I've got to go to the dentist this afternoon, oh, I'm terribly <laughs> sorry. You know, anything to get out of going to spend an hour with someone like that. Okay, never mind. So they hang up. One minute later you get another call from another girl. They said, Hi, are you, you free this afternoon? I said, Oh no, so I just made an appointment for a dentist. Oh, that's a shame because I know you're always talking about Gloria Jeans and the lattes there are to die for. I, I want to try one. I never had one before, but I want to try what you like. And you always like sitting out on the veranda, so I don't mind sitting out on the veranda too. And you say those chocolate chip muffins. They're really delicious. Yeah, I want to try one. And you know, you've always been talking about Buddhism this and Buddhism that and meditation. And actually, I'm interested. I'd like to, to you know to, you to explain to me what Buddhism is and meditation is. And if somebody says that to you, they want to go to where you want to go, try your coffee and your muffins, and talk about what you're, you're interested in, you say, okay, I'm cancelling the dentist appointment. <laughs> See you there in ten minutes. <laughs> And then you go there, and you've only got an hour, but you end up spending all afternoon there, three hours and four hours, and you get late back home. <coughs> now that's because that person's being kind to you. Now what does that simile mean? The simile means that you are that person calling up your mind. And you say, right mind, we're going to do Anapanasati. Not what you want to do, you can do Anapanasati. <laughs> You're not going to watch your breath at the tip of the nose, you're going to watch it at the belly, because that's what I want you to watch it. We're going to meditate for exactly an hour, not 30 minutes, not an hour and a half, one hour. We're going to sit where I want to sit, which is on the floor, on full lotus, not how you like to sit, on all these cushions or chairs. <laughs> and we're going to do this, okay? Now that's what many of you do when you meditate. You tell your mind what to do, and how to do it, and for how long. No wonder your mind runs away from you. I'm going to sleep, I'm getting away from her. <laughs> I'm going to fantasize about anything, anything to get away from this control freak meditating. <laughs> <laughs> That's why your mind wanders off. I often reflect, to why do minds wander off? Why? You don't have to think about the past, you don't have to think of these fantasies and all these plans for this future, you know that they're, they're useless, you don't have to do that, but why do you do it? Because your mind is running away from you. You've got a bad reputation. <laughs> you're always telling your mind what to do and blaming it when it doesn't do it. So if you're like that, the next meditation, you look at your mind and say, hey mind, what do you want to do? If you want to go and think something, off you go. Wander away, with my permission. If you want to fall asleep, fine mind. I want to work with you, rather than controlling you. If you try that, your mind will wander off, will fall asleep, will think about all sorts of things, testing you out. And if you allow it, if you let it, if you let it be, if you're kind, mind, the door of my heart is open to you. No matter what you do, then you find your mind will come back. It will stay with you. It realizes, hey, she's not a bad boss. She's actually kind. I'm going to hang out with her. That's what I do with my mind. Um, <laughs> here we go. Six years as a monk. And I found this monastery in the north of Thailand. It was the perfect monastery. It had caves. I love caves. It had Oh, the most delicious papaya I've ever eaten in my life. There's this papaya tree right in front of the caves. And the, and the bats would come out 
sort of at night time they shit all over the mango, all over the papaya tree, and then they fly back and shit before they went back into the cave again. This papaya was so well fertilized. I've never eaten papaya like that ever since. It was absolutely sweet, <coughs> delicious, the most, because it was, you know, it was processed batshit. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> but it's so delicious. And the lay people there, they actually, they weren't interested in meditation. They weren't interested in Dharma, they just wanted to feed me. And that was great! <laughs> and they didn't have to answer any questions or do anything, just meditate all day. And it's by myself, in this big quiet monastery up in the mountains. Nice and cool. And even better than that, you know I was born in England. This monastery was right bang smack in the middle of a tea plantation. <laughs> this was... this. <laughs> was heaven for an English monk. <laughs> as much tea as I ever wanted to drink. And I was having a difficult time there. Everything was totally perfect. But then my mind started to wander around. And it started to think and think and think. And you know what happened soon? I started to think of what I call these days unmonkish thoughts. <laughs> Thinking, old oh, girlfriends, I wonder if she's still available. No, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a... Oh, you know, you know, she's... No, no, stop it, I jump right. Stop it, stop it. <laughs> and then sexual fantasies. No, I don't want that. I want to meditate. And it was so difficult to control my mind. You know, I, I tried, OK, come on, stay on the bed. Come breathing in, breathing out. And just, oh, no, no, stop it. That's disgusting. Stop it, go back. <laughs> And if ever you've had any problems like that, you know, it's just so difficult and it's just so tiring and frustrating. And I, you know, I really love being a monk. I don't want to disrobe, but these thoughts came in and I tried to push them out and they came in even stronger. And I had no one to talk to. I was by myself. And it got so bad one day, it was about a week of this, really tiring and just wondering what to do next. I'd like you going crazy. And so, out of total frustration, I went into the hall, I bowed to the big Buddha statue. There's always a Buddha statue there in these temples. Bowed to the Buddha statue and just basically said, help. And an insight came up, almost immediately. Do a deal. And the deal was this. My mind would watch the breath and behave for most of the day. But I gave myself Three, uh, one hour every afternoon, 3 to 4 p.m., to think sexy thoughts. <laughs> That's my sexy thought time. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, it's fair enough. Mind, if you want to think those sorts of thoughts, okay, one hour every day. That is your time, the rest of the time you behave. You know, that's how I thought at those times. I thought that would work. <laughs> So, and I made the determination in front of the Buddha statue, so now I keep those resolutions and determinations, and so I went off meditating, it didn't help. Still those thoughts kept on trying to come in, I'm pushing them away, come in again, let them go, pushing them again, oh, it's just so tiring, fighting with your mind, trying to be a good monk. And when it came to 3 p.m., you know, you're really tired. So I was just, I was just leaning against the wall, putting my feet out, and I said, OK, now mind, you can do whatever you want. Any thought, the most ridiculous, kinky, sexy, any girlfriend, whatever you want to do, I'm not going to stop you. Go for it. And for the next hour, <laughs> this is crazy. For the next hour, I watched every breath without missing one. <laughs> no crazy thoughts at all. Just watching the breath. And that really shook me. But what's going on? Why is it when I'm trying to watch the breath, I'm having all these stupid thoughts coming in? And when I say, OK, stupid thoughts, you can come in, I'd only watch the breath. I learned. I was control freak. And the more I tried to control the mind, the more these thoughts would come in. I was feeding them. And as soon as I let go, OK, if you want to come in, that's fine. I'm going to be kind to your mind, whatever you want to do. Then my mind never went anywhere to stay with the breath. These are amazing experiences, but you try that sometimes. You be kind to your mind. 
You tell the mind, whatever you want to think about, wherever you want to sit, whatever coffee you want, I'm going to want the same. Letting go, being kind. And of course, then your mind wants to work with you. Now I've been practicing like that for years. My mind and I, we're the best of friends. As soon as I start meditating, close my eyes, my eyes, hey, Ajahn Brahm again, hey, great, let's meditate together, yeah, let's chill out together. So we hang out together. Just like, you know, two young people hanging out at the shopping mall or hanging out in the park or whatever. My mind and I, we just hang out for hours. No effort, because we like each other. So, of course, mind doesn't go anywhere. Kindness, do you get that? If you try and control your mind, and say, right, stay on the breath. Every time it goes off, bring it back again. Every time it goes off again, bring it back again. How many years have you done that? Does it work? <laughs> it doesn't. You know, you just, your mind gets really fed up with you. you now, it's going off somewhere, you keep bringing it back, going off somewhere, bringing it back every time. Gee, now, why won't you let me alone? <laughs> or another example of this letting go business. <laughs> this was two stories, ex almost exactly the same. This woman in Australia, are oh, just some people, they're just emotionally geniuses. This was the super mum. And, ah, oh, no, I'll just take my, if I had a hat, I'd take it off for her. I'll take my beanie off for her, but I hardly wear the word beanies. She was so smart, she had a six-year-old boy. At home, one day, six-year-old said, got a tantrum, like kids do. Mummy, I don't love you anymore. I'm leaving home. So a six-year-old was threatening to leave home. If that was your kid, what would you do? You'd say, don't be stupid, you can't leave home. But this was a very smart mum. She said, okay, I will help you pack. <laughs> so she went into the kid's bedroom and helped him pack, you know, his uh, Spider-Man suit, you know, his teddy bear, whatever was really important to take off into his life. And having packed his bag, his little suitcase, then mum said, oh, before you go, you know, I'll make you uh, something for your lunch. So made his favourite sandwich, put it in a brown paper bag, and then waved off her son at the door of the house. Bye-bye, darling, have a wonderful life, don't forget to write. <laughs> and there was a six-year-old <laughs> with a suitcase in one hand and a paper bag walking down the path into his life. He left home. So he walked to the end of the path, you know, to the gate, opened the gate and then turned left down the road. Six-year-old, leaving home for the first time. <laughs> he got about 100 metres down the road, and felt terribly homesick, turned around. <laughs> so he's six. <laughs> turned around, opened the gate, down the path. Mum hadn't moved. Welcome home, darling. <laughs> now that was emotional intelligence. That was a really smart woman. She knew the kid wouldn't go that far, it would turn around again. But when she let it go, knowing it would come back, she stopped all this controlling and all this argument, all this fighting from a six-year-old against the authority of the mum. That was brilliant. And <laughs> I remember telling that story in a retreat to this Singaporean girl. She was a, a, a counsellor, just gone over to, I think, Oxford and come back again, you know, doing some um, PhD or something in counselling. And when I told her that story, you know, she was a Singaporean Buddhist, she became totally disrespectful. She was holding her tummy, laughing her head off, rolling in front of me. You know, and <laughs> She was hysterical. And I said, what, what, what are you doing? That's disrespectful. What, what, what's up? And he said, you wouldn't believe this, Ajahn Brahm. Almost exactly the same happened to me when I was five in Singapore. I had a tantrum and I told my mum, I'm leaving home. But this was in the, the big apartment blocks. And so my mum also, she did exactly the same. She packed my bag for me, but she never made me lunch, she said. She gave me $20 by your own lunch. <laughs> because that's what they do in Singapore. <laughs> Too busy to make lunch, buy your own. So she said, I took my 20 bucks and <laughs> my little bag, went on into the elevator, my mum saw me off, as the elevator doors closed, bye-bye darling, have a wonderful life. I just made it to the ground floor before I was homesick, she said. <laughs> 
pressed the button where I lived, on the floor I lived, went straight back up, and Mum was, hadn't moved from outside the elevator. Welcome home, darling. <laughs> now those are emotional intelligence, that's how you work with your own mind. When your mind says, I'm leaving, I've had it with you, I'm not going to watch the breath, I'm not going to meditate, what are you trying to tell me to do? Pack your mind's bags, give it a sandwich or 20 bucks, whatever you can afford. <laughs> bye bye mind, have a wonderful time. And off your mind goes, it won't go that far. If you're kind to it, you'll get homesick. It loves you, you'll come back. When it comes back, it stays with you. No problem at all. So sometimes, when you're meditating, you can actually ask your mind, mind, what do you want to do today? I often do that. Mind, how are you? What do you want to do this morning? And he says, oh, I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. OK, off you go. I said, I want to think about my monastery and what I'm supposed to do. OK, off you go. And when I said that, I said, mind, what do you want to do now? I said, I want to meditate now, thank you. <laughs> So we meditate together. And my mind loves me so much, we have some wonderful times meditating. It's a different attitude, you're not controlling anymore. You're working with your body, working with this thing called the mind. You're letting it be, being kind to it. That is a way to meditate. Me and my mind have had such wonderful times together. So wonderful times when we see each other. Yeah, let's go and do it again. Yeah. <laughs> That is how to meditate. No force, but wisdom power. And the last one of the, where we go, talking too long again. The last one is the gentleness. The gentleness, which is the Ahingsaka Sankapa. Basically, non violence. You all remember Gandhi and his Ahingsa? Oh, and this is actually what it says in the, the third part, third fact, the third part of the second fact of the Noble Eightfold Path. Ahingsaka Sankapo, intentions of non-violence, of gentleness. So when you have these retreats where they force you to come and meditate, or they force you to do 50 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, that's not Buddhism, it's not gentleness. It hasn't got the softness of the Dhamma, and the beauty, the kindness, the warmth of the Buddha's teachings. And the gentleness, be gentle to yourself. So, you know, if you need to take a rest, take a rest. If you want to go for a walk, have a walk. If you need to go and have a cup of tea, have a cup of tea. Be gentle with yourself. And then you find it so easy to meditate. Have a wonderful time, every time you meditate. If you just remember, letting go, being kind, being gentle. You know, sometimes it's not what you're aware of in meditation. Are you aware of the breath, or are you aware of sleepiness, or are you aware of a wandering mind, or are you aware of nimittas, are you aware of jhanas, what are you aware of? That's not important. What is important is how you are aware of whatever is in front of your mind. What are you doing with what you're aware of? That is important. Are you letting go? Are you wanting something? If you're wanting something, you're going to get nowhere meditation. Are you being kind? Or are you being sort of angry at your mind? Stupid mind! How many times have I got to sit here before you stop thinking these stupid thoughts? I've told you many times, stop thinking about the future. Stop it mind! Stupid mind! <laughs> that is nothing to do with Buddhism. Be kind to your mind. You know, I was Telling the monks about one of my favourite monks, as well, as well as Ajahn Chah. There was a monk called Ajahn Tate. He lived in this monastery close to the Mekong River. He's one of you know, Ajahn Chah's, Ajahn Mun's disciples. And, you know, sometimes if you, if you see a great monk or a great nun, you're so fortunate. And I went to see this monk once, when I was young. I was scared when I first went to see him. Because these monks, you know, they can read minds, as I said last night. Yeah, m monks can read minds. And I was scared. Because I didn't really understand what was going on with Buddhism. I was scared that he will read my mind and tell other people what I was up to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like you. <laughs> but, 
you know, he was very wise too and I had all these questions I needed to ask somebody so I went to see him, made an appointment because he was very famous at this time, went into the room to see him and you know what it's like if you meet someone who's really, really, really kind? All my fear just totally vanished. I'd realised if he did read my mind, he would be kind to me, he wouldn't tell anybody. He wouldn't sort of spill the beans, what I was really thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and also, all my questions just evaporated. Just couldn't think of any questions. I had them all prepared beforehand, but they just vanished. And instead I felt this beautiful kindness envelop me. And even with my own father, even with Ajahn Chah, I never ever felt so much kindness, so much acceptance. I didn't need to be different than I was. Stupid, unenlightened as I was, crazy as my mind was, he would accept it. This if you ever had like one of these grandfathers or grandmothers who would never ever criticize you, who just wanted to feed you and look after you and nurture you and care for you, that's what I felt. Total acceptance. Total safety. And the thought came into my mind, not my questions. Honestly, the thought was, I'm not going to move from here. They're going to have to drag me out of here with bulldozers. <laughs> I'm going to sit here and die in this, <laughs> in this spot. Because you felt so accepted, you know, so loved, I mean real love, totally accepted, totally loved. He didn't want anything from you, he just cared for you. And that was such a beautiful feeling. And that also taught me how to meditate. I felt so peaceful I didn't want to move, because I was cared for. If you can care for your mind like that, mind, you're crazy, I'm not going to try and make you enlightened. <laughs> I'm not even going to try and get rid of all your defilements. I'm not going to try and get rid of your sloth and torpor, your restlessness. It's okay, mind. You can be like this for the rest of my life and the next seven lives. I just care for you. And then your mind just doesn't want to go anywhere. And you get so incredibly still, almost immediately. Stop. You just fall into a jhana. You can't stop it with that incredible kindness. This, that's how you feel. You don't want to go anywhere. You have to pull me away with, with all the water buffaloes in northeast Thailand. They won't be able to move me. That is how you feel when you have this beautiful kindness. So, please be kind to your mind when you're meditating. And then you find meditation is the easiest thing in the world. Sitting there, just you and your mind chilling out together, not moving, and all these incredible states of meditation, they just pour one after the other. And the gentleness of kindness, that's why second noble truth, sorry, second noble truth, second factor of the Eightfold Path. Sometimes instead of saying letting go, or a renunciation, sometimes I call that making peace. And that's why on some t-shirts people have put these three words, make peace, be kind, be gentle. And I actually say it's Ajahn Brahm, it's not Ajahn Brahm, it's the Buddha. Make peace, be kind, be gentle, in every moment. Meditate like that. What are you experiencing right now? Make peace with it, don't try and change it. Don't try and get rid of it. Don't struggle and strive. Be kind to it, with all your stupid mind, sicknesses, dullness, sloth and torpor, restlessness, sexy thoughts, whatever you've got, be kind to it and be really gentle. And then the reason why you have those stupid thoughts is taken away. The cause of restlessness is undermined. Restlessness is just trying to escape from yourself, trying to escape from this moment. Go anywhere so you don't have to face the pain of now. When you're kind and you're gentle, now is a very nice place to be. And your mind gets all still and all peaceful, all by itself. And you just sit there just making peace, being kind, being gentle. And everything gets calm and still. Your body vanishes. Just a breath comes to you, you're just being kind, making peace with this breath, being gentle with her. 
The breath comes in and goes out. You're not doing anything, just making peace, being kind, being gentle. And then the breath gets so soft because you're being kind, hanging out with your mind, and your breath vanishes. So these beautiful lights. And you're just making peace with those lights, being kind, being gentle, you're not doing anything. Right, you can stay as long as you like. If you want to go, that's fine by me. I'll pack your bags and give you 20 bucks. <laughs> right, so you don't have to stay. Just making peace, being kind, being gentle. The lights get brighter and brighter and wow. And you're off into the jhana realms. So easy. <laughs> <laughs> But you get involved and you make it difficult. Come on! <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time, it's not working. What do you mean, not working? What are you trying to expect? Wanting this and wanting that, that's the problem. As I said last night, you're hopeless, you're not going to get jhana today, so give up. Who the hell do you think you are? Trying to get jhana, trying to get so on? <coughs> no hope at all, give up, let go. And then you get jealous <laughs> and get in line. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing. So give up. <laughs> okay, no ego, no sense of self. No, I'm going to get this because I've been coming to BSV for such a long time. I'm a doctor. I'm a professor. I can do this. You know, I'm Sri Lankan. The Buddhism is in my blood. I'm going to do this. <laughs> Okay, don't be stupid like that. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> any, any questions or comments about this morning's talk? Okay, so let's meditate now for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> no! Whoa. Okay, actually, um, should we have a break first of all? Yeah, let's have a break for a quarter of an hour and then we can meditate after a quarter of an hour. Let's be kind. <laughs> to your bladder. <laughs> Very good. So in that session I did make an important point about meditation. It's not so important of what you are aware of, but how you are aware. Sometimes people put too much attention, oh, I'm only aware of the breath, I want to be aware of something else. But it's, again, how you are aware. It's what I call making good meditation karma. Just again, using the Buddhist idea of law of karma. If you make good karma, you get good results. So what's good meditation karma? Karma is right intention. If you're making peace, being kind, being gentle, you are making the grounds for future success in meditation. If you want to have peace in your heart, in your mind, you have to make peace. So the very peaceful states of mind, they're like these brick houses. If you see a brick layer, they lay one brick at a time. Another brick, another brick, another brick. And after a while you've got the completed house of bricks. So if you make peace with every moment, this moment now, it may not be what you like, it may be what you like, doesn't matter, treat it all equally, just be at peace with it. Make peace with this moment, make peace again, make peace again. And if you have many moments of peace, one after another, you're making the house of peace inside of your own heart. And again, this kindness, you always notice just how kindness would actually solve so many problems. And especially inside of yourself, kindness relaxes you. It is kindness which a doctor who is just really kind to you, or a nurse who is really kind to you, or even a friend who is kind to you, they will uh, heal many, many illnesses, especially many emotional illnesses. Kindness is one of the most powerful forces in this world. And of course being very gentle. Part of gentleness includes being patient. So it's one of the nice things about being a Buddhist. There's no rush to be a so on. Not in this life, the next life, not the life, next life, the one afterwards. Stop being in such a rush. Because if you're rushing to be these things, of course you'd never get anywhere. But if you're patient, 
and everything comes to you. But there's two types of patience which I like to point out in meditation. And one type of patience is when people complain, it's not working, I've been letting go, I've been kind to my mind and it's just thinking all over the place. It doesn't work at your Brahm, it's because you're waiting for something to happen and it doesn't. That's what we call waiting in the future, waiting for something to happen. You're not really in the present moment. When's the jhana coming? When's the nimitta coming? When's the enlightenment coming? When's peace coming? Come on, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I've been waiting for two days, Ajahn Brahm. Nothing's happening yet. It doesn't work. It is because you have not been following the instructions. If you follow the instructions, they work. So, we make peace, be kind, be gentle. In this moment, we wait in the moment rather than waiting in the future. That's one of the biggest problems for people who have had a good meditation before. Sometimes people have had one good meditation and they can't get it back again, they feel so frustrated. Until you realise, why is it not coming back again? It's because you're expecting it, you're waiting for it to happen. Have you ever noticed that expectation is one of the biggest hindrances in meditation? And it's actually the opposite of insight. Insight is looking inwards, expect is looking outwards. So don't expect, inspect. <laughs> and so you don't wait for something to happen. You are just concerned what's happening right now. That's the only thing which you look at. As far as the future is concerned, the future is totally uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen next. And you can't predict what's going to happen next. All you people who go to fortune tellers in Kataragama, <laughs> you are crazy people. If those fortune tellers were any good, how many of those fortune tellers predicted the election in Sri Lanka? <laughs> how many of those fortune tellers predicted the tsunami. How many of those fortune tellers can even predict their own future? One of my sayings, never ever trust a poor fortune teller. <laughs> if they can't tell their own fortune, how on earth are they going to tell yours? <laughs> and it's true, the future is totally uncertain. But sometimes people think monks Maybe monks who meditate, maybe we can see the future. Like I said yesterday about the miracle, where the person who hired the tents for our big ceremony, once we realised we'd stopped the storm, asked Ajahn Brahm, can you tell me who's going to win the horse racing today? <laughs> they think that we know the future. And sometimes the monks do know the future. I say that carefully. I can predict the future. <coughs> Just the same as my great teacher. Because one day this man came to see him and said, Ajahn Chah, I know you can do this. Don't deny it. You're a great monk. Can you read my future? Here, look at my hand. Read the lines on my hand and tell me what's going to happen to me. And Ajahn said, no, good monks don't do that. And this guy had been prepared, he knew that's what Ajahn Chah would answer. So he reminded my teacher, on the last talk you gave, you gave a sermon about gratitude. I have been giving donations to your temple for years. I've been feeding you almost every day. I have been looking after you and driving you around to airports and, and, and you talk about gratitude? This is the first time I've asked you for anything. Come on, show some gratitude. Tell me my fortune. Never try and outwit a monk. <laughs> Especially one like Ajahn Chah. So Ajahn says, okay, I will do this for the first and only time. I will read the lines on your palm and tell you your future. 
And this guy was really excited. This was a great monk. And the only time he was going to read the future of somebody. And he knew that monks like Ajahn Chah can't lie. They won't lie. So he was really excited. And Ajahn Chah was very slow and careful. He took the guy's palm and with his finger he drew his, his finger along the lines. And with great concentration and mindfulness he looked and every now and again he'd say, hmm, that's good. <laughs> Ooh, that's not so good. <laughs> and this poor man was getting more and more exciting. Ooh, hmm. And it took almost forever for Ajahn Chah to finish reading. Because if you're going to do it, you've got to do it properly. You know, give it everything you've got. And you can't make mistakes. This is important. And so when he finally finished reading this guy's palm, the guy was so expectant, so excited. Yes, yes, yes. What's my future going to be? And Ajahn Chah replied very slowly. He said, Look, I am a monk. What I say is going to come true. Yes, I know that. Get on with it. What is my future going to be? Your future. So, yes, yes, yes. Your future is going to be uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. Ajahn <laughs> Chah was playing with him all the time. But it was very true. So I can read fortunes too. Your future is uncertain. I should actually get my own column in the newspapers telling horoscopes. <laughs> Leo, today is uncertain. <laughs> Virgo, uncertain as well. <laughs> Capricorn, anything could happen. <laughs> so that's the future, it's totally uncertain. So why even think about it? Why plan it? Who knows what's going to happen next? But we want to make sure our future is happy. We want to do the best for our future. <coughs> Which is why you must always remember when is the only time you can do anything about your future? Right now. When is your future being made? Right now. So if you care about your future, if you want your future to be peaceful, happy, wonderful, where should you be looking and working? Right now. The place where your future is being made. Right now. So once you understand that, you realize when we look in the future, we plan this and plan this, we're actually neglecting the future. Because we're paying no attention to the place where the future is being made. Right now. So that's why even in meditation, they forget about the next moment. Right now, the next moment is being made. So put all your attention in this present moment. And make peace. Be kind. Be gentle. That's what we need to do. And you can know for sure that you're doing the very, very best for your future. You can't do better than that, especially in meditation. Which is why that sometimes people tell me, said, oh, but I'm tired, I can't meditate today. I'm sick, I've got the flu, I can't meditate today. I'm old, I've got arthritis, I'm in pain, I can't meditate today. And I tell them, can you make peace with what you're experiencing right now? Can you do that? Yeah, I, I can do that. Can you be kind to whatever you're experiencing right now? Yeah, I can do that. Can you be gentle? Yeah. Then you can meditate. Because that's what meditation is. The attitude of making peace, being kind, being gentle. Meditation is not watching your breath. That's just something which happens in meditation. That's not what meditation is. Meditation is not experiencing jhanas, that's just what happens in the long term. Meditation is making peace, being kind, being gentle. And if you understand that, you can meditate any time and you know the results are going to happen. 
It reminds me of one of my favourite stories, which is now a joke on the internet. These jokes which you read on the internet, you know where they come from? They go round and round and round. Some of them came from me. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. <laughs> and sometimes they come round and somebody passes me a joke and says, Hey, look at this one. Actually, it's really funny. So yeah, yeah, that's one of mine. <laughs> it all started with meditation jokes. And this is a meditation story. It's a funny story, but it makes a point. It's about the migrant, the refugee who came to Melbourne, got resettled here. And as soon as he came to Melbourne, he was looking for a job. His wife told him to get some work. So, like many people, he gets a job on a building site as a labourer. And he worked all day on Monday, really hard. When he went back home, his wife said, How much did you earn today, darling? Nothing, they never paid me. And he went to work again on Tuesday at the building site, worked even harder, mixing concrete, wheelbarrowing this, carrying that. And the end of the day on Tuesday, when he went back home, How much did you earn today, darling? And they didn't pay me again. And he went to work on Wednesday, the same thing happened. He said, I'm not going to work anymore. You work really hard in Australia, they don't pay you anything. And his wife said, oh, I'll just go to work on Thursday, see what happens. You're not doing anything. So he went to work on Thursday, the same happened again. And he wasn't going to work again, it's only he had nothing else to do on Friday. So he went there, just, just nothing more to do, with no expectations. And of course, on Friday, his boss gave him this big pay packet. And when he went back home, he told his wife, darling, I finally figured out how it works in Australia. From now on, I'm only going to go to work on Friday. <laughs> but you, you all know that you get paid on Friday or the end of the month for all the work you've done on the other days. That's payday. <laughs> but, like meditation, you have paydays sometimes. When you get very peaceful, it's working, wow, nice meditation. And what happens again? You think next meditation will be the same. You don't get paid on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, okay? The money accumulates, and when you've got enough, then you get paid. Just like meditation, you can't have payday every meditation. So after you've had a good meditation, okay, back to work. <laughs> so what you do, you make peace, be kind, be gentle. Make peace, be kind, be gentle. Make peace, be kind, be gentle. That's your work. And when you've worked enough, when you've accumulated enough peace, enough kindness, enough gentleness, then you get payday. And yeah, those of you who haven't had payday yet on this retreat, don't ask for your money back. You didn't pay anything anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Don't ask for your donations back. <laughs> no. Always remember, the cheque is in the mail. <laughs> it's coming! So your job is don't wait in the future expecting something to happen. Because that's what happens when you expect something to happen, it never does. Just like one of these nuns, she's now a nun at Dharmasara. She went on one of my retreats. And she was really a yeah, very good meditator, very devout Buddhist, keeping precepts and really being generous. And meditate, meditate, meditate. Nine whole days. Got absolutely nowhere. And nine days in a nice retreat. She got really disappointed with herself. And when we finished off the retreat and did the last chanting, nowhere. <laughs> what a waste of time. But, she was going to get a taxi to the airport to get her flight back to Malaysia and she had an hour to kill. So there's nothing else to do, might as well meditate anyway. And she was meditating, she told me afterwards, just meditating to kill time. Not expecting anything. And that's when she got her paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> she, she came up afterwards to me, it's really cute when people have a nice deep meditation and they come up to report afterwards. It's one of the cutest things. Because I was sitting on a chair and she was kneeling on the ground looking at me with these big doe eyes. 
I don't know. Oh, it's, oh, it's, oh, it's, it's so wonderful. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm so large. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> I don't know if you ever have a daughter and she falls in love for the first time. Oh, Mum, I'm in love. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was like. It's so cute. <laughs> she got her first big meditation. And why? Because she wasn't expecting it. Totally unexpected. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's why many other people... Look, remember Ananda's story of how he got his big meditation and got enlightened. Ananda, the attendant of the Buddha. Went 25 years he was attending on the greatest master, dharma teacher, meditator the world has ever seen. Imagine that, close up and personal to the Buddha himself. And when the Buddha passed away, Adnanda was still not enlightened. And quite reasonably, quite logically, he thought, crikey, if I've been with the Buddha for 25 years, You've only been with a couple of monks a day and a half. Twenty-five years! Not in line at all. You think, what a waste of an opportunity. I'm really stupid. I'm never going to get enlightened now. But what happened next was two or three months later they were having a big meeting of all the monks. Five hundred monks were invited to the meeting to collect all the teachings. And quite understandably, they chose all the Arahats, all the fully enlightened monks. But one of them said, well, what about Ananda? Even though he's not enlightened like us, he's heard so much and remembered so many teachings from the Buddha. We have to invite him for the conference, even though he's not enlightened. So he got his invitation to the conference. But imagine how he would have felt. <laughs> all his friends were fully enlightened and he was not. Imagine what that must be like. It's just like if this evening, before you all left, I made the announcement that every one of you had got a jhana, except for you. <laughs> How would you feel? Yeah, that sucks. That's terrible. <laughs> Why not me? Everyone else? Uh. And that's what he felt, even worse. All his friends were enlightened and he wasn't. So what did he do? Right. Tonight is the night. He gave it everything he'd got, didn't go to sleep, meditated all night, meditating, walking, remembering all the great teachings of his master, putting them into practice, trying his heart out, and at the end of the day, when the mo end of the night rather, when the, morning, the sun rose, he was as stupid as ever. <laughs> so what did Ananda do? He decided another hour before the meeting, I'll just take a nap. And to this day we call this, this the Ananda method of meditation. <laughs> he took a nap. And as the saying goes, you all know the story, just before his head hit the pillow, he became fully enlightened. So if this doesn't work here, tonight. <laughs> And if you only sleep once a day, just at night time, you reduce your chances. Take a morning nap, an afternoon <laughs> nap. The more chances you've got to hit the pillow, the more chances. <laughs> and just before his head hit the pillow, he became fully enlightened. Not just enlightened, with all the psychic powers as well. And according to the, the story, he decided on purpose to arrive late for the meeting. And they closed the door and locked it. And Ananda knew that. And Ananda, he came into the meeting through the keyhole. <laughs> we call that making an entrance. <laughs> Just to prove to everybody else he'd attained. So if you want to attain, if you want to show me that you've attained something in this meditation, <laughs> go into the monk's quarters through the keyhole and then we'd be quite impressed, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> so, but why did that happen? How come he'd been trying all night, he was with a great teacher, nothing happened, and when he decided to take a nap, it all happened. Why? 
because he was letting go. He gave up. He stopped trying. He had all of the, the ingredients, but he hadn't let go. And the last little story which emphasizes this, which Priya reminded me of, the donkey. <laughs> this is one of my great similes, the donkey story. You all know donkeys, they're supposed to be the most, the most stubborn creatures in the whole world. All of you have got husbands. <laughs> husbands aren't stubborn, donkeys are. Wives, kids, you can get a kid to do something with a bribe, but donkey, no, nothing. <laughs> That's why you can hit a donkey, take a stick and beat it and it won't move. And that's the wrong way of getting a donkey to move. For donkeys, you have to not hit the donkey with a stick, you tie the stick to the back of the donkey's neck. So the front is two foot in front of the donkey's head. Tie a string to the end of that stick and a carrot to the end of that uh, string. If it is a Sri Lankan donkey, it has to be a hopper. <laughs> If it is Malaysian from Penang, a durian. Because <laughs> people in Penang, they love their durians. If it is an English donkey, fish and chips. <laughs> or a cup of tea with Tim Kiri. <laughs> but with a carrot. The donkey sees a carrot two foot in front of its head. And what does the donkey do? Walks towards the carrot. When he walks towards the carrot, out of craving, yeah, the stick moves, the string moves, and the carrot moves. And even if the donkey runs after the carrot, still the carrot's two foot in front of the donkey's head. And that is like life, like even meditation. Sometimes you can see, you can understand it. And you go towards, say, the breath, or go towards, and go towards peace, and it always moves away from you. Or like life in general. Happiness, achievement, satisfaction. Have you ever noticed it's almost right in front of you? What you want in life, you go towards it and it moves further away. The beautiful, perfect relationship, the happiness in a family, paying off all your debts, you get so close and the government increases the GST. <laughs> or the tax or something. You almost make it but it always goes away from you. And that's like the donkey with the carrot. No matter how fast, how long it chases the carrot, it never reaches the carrot. And that's like meditation too. But, the Buddha figured out how to catch carrots. And if a donkey is smart enough to come to the BSV, <laughs> or any other Buddhist temples, a donkey learns how to catch the carrots. And it's so simple, once you understand it, once you've heard it, once you've heard it afterwards, you think, how could I miss that? It's so simple to catch carrots. So what do you do? <coughs> you run after the carrot first of all. You run, run, run as hard as you can. It doesn't matter how fast you run. The carrot is always two foot in front of your mouth. But the Buddhist donkey, they know how to stop and wait in the moment. And that's what the donkey does. It stops suddenly. What happens to the carrot? The carrot swings further and further away until the carrot's four foot away from the donkey's mouth. Never been as far away before. And what does a donkey do? Patience. Just making peace, being kind, being gentle <coughs> with knowing the carrot's going further and further away. And then something strange happens. Never before has a donkey experienced this the carrot starts to move towards the donkey. And soon it's two foot in front of the donkey's mouth again, like it normally is. But now it's coming at full speed towards the donkey's mouth. And the donkey just needs to wait. The carrot comes towards the donkey. But it's not just stopping. There's another teaching the donkey remembers, that it's the most important teaching, or not one of the most, the most important, but one of the two most important teachings, the stopping first of all. And that means the carrot goes further away and starts coming towards the donkey. The other teaching is kindness. Just at the right moment, the donkey says, carrot, 
the door of my mouth is open to you. <laughs> Come in. Otherwise it just bounces off its teeth. <laughs> like some you get close to enlightenment, but without the kindness, you don't let it come in. <laughs> so that, that is how the donkeys catch the carrot. And you've always been running after enlightenment, running after so one, running after jhanas, running after insight. You've been meditating for years, some of you, running after these things. Have you ever got the carrot yet? How many retreats have some of you been on? How long have you been coming to temples? How long have you been meditating? Some of you for years and years and years and years and years and yet still haven't got the carrot. Why? Because you haven't learned how to stop. One of the nice things about that story is when you do stop, when you let go, I'm just going to make peace, be kind, be gentle. The carrot goes further away. You fall asleep. When you're kind to the mind, the mind goes thinking, restless, the carrot's going further away. And people say, oh, it's not working. Ajahn Brahm's method, do nothing, I just fall asleep. Ajahn Brahm's method, just be kind, I just thinking about all sorts of sexy thoughts or all what sorts, sorts of other thoughts you have. It's not working. The carrot's going further away, that's what's supposed to happen. Don't do anything, don't spoil it. Just continue just standing there like a wise Buddhist donkey. And soon, and it's one of the most incredible experiences, the carrot starts coming towards you. You're not doing anything. Sitting here, just making peace, being kind, being gentle, not wanting anything in the world. And you can see your breath so clearly. Just the breath is there. It's coming in, going out. It comes in and out so peaceful. And the mindfulness starts to increase. It becomes a delightful, happy breath. The carrot's coming. And you start to see these great nimitas, these beautiful lights in the mind. You're doing nothing. You didn't ask for them. The carrot's coming towards you. And beautiful nimitas and deep jhanas. The carrot's almost in your mouth. And then, thank you, insights. And you've got the carrot. That's how it works. So stop chasing things. Stop craving and wanting. And the carrot comes to you. That's what my simile, uh, uh, original Ajahn Brahm, but Ajahn Chah did a much better simile. And this was the one which was, he said in the first year I was a monk, never understood it at all. And there was a time I thought Ajahn Chah was crazy. <laughs> Honestly, I did. But you know, he had another, a few other wise things. Actually, I'll tell you just why I stayed with Ajahn Chah. When I first went up to see him, he's supposed to be a great monk, but I really thought he was, please excuse me, an idiot, stupid. He tried to, to praise me. And I thought, I'm not into that, being praised. I can see through that very quickly. Because we were making these little baskets to, you know, for his mother's funeral. And he said, oh, you make very nice baskets. I looked at my basket, it was a mess. <laughs> you know, just praise is not going to get you to be my disciple. <coughs> It'd get me to be your disciple, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But then, I was just busy working and there was another monk and he had some questions to ask Ajahn Chah. And so through the interpreter, he asked Ajahn Chah this question and I was just listening, you know, doing nothing else, just overhearing. And then Ajahn Chah gave this answer. Said, That's not the question this young monk asked. It was a question I was thinking. And so I thought of another question in my mind. Never said it. And then this monk, this Western monk from New Mexico, he asked another question, translated, the answer came back. My second question was answered. <laughs> and I did, we did this for about three or four minutes. All these questions I was thinking, Ajahn Chah was answering, and not the questions this monk was actually getting translated. And I asked him afterwards, what do you think of Ajahn Chah's answers to your questions? He said, I couldn't understand a word of them. <laughs> he said, yeah, because he wasn't answering you, he was answering me. And that was impressive, you know, he was reading my mind. And you know, he did that. And, that, and when you did have something like that, you think, okay, I'm going to stay here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> you know, obviously, he knew, was, knew what was going on. So it was really, very impressive. But at the same time, he gave some teachings, and this one I couldn't understand. But a lot of this time, you know, when I give you deep teachings, I don't care if you don't understand them, because they lodge in your subconscious, and later on you remember them. 
and they work. And that's what Ajahn Shah used to do to me. Give me these incredible teachings which I hadn't an idea what he meant. But they stayed. And this one was just, this was an a incredible, accurate, beautiful simile. And that's why I, I was always trying to find a place to, to write it down, because I haven't seen it in any, any other book. And I wrote it down in the Good, Bad, Who Knows book. Even though it's supposed to be stories and funny stories, but this one is in there as well, because I needed to put it out somewhere. And that's the story of his monastery being the mango orchard. He said his monastery in the northeast of Tata was a mango orchard. There wasn't any mangoes in that monastery, just trees, other trees. And he said the mango trees had been planted by the Buddha. Okay, this is some silly story. And he said, right now, those mango trees are full of delicious, ripe mangoes. Thousands of them, he said. But, he said, you monks, if you try and climb the tree to get a mango, you'll never get one. If you shake the tree to get some to fall, none will fall. If you throw a stick up or get a ladder to try and pick the mangoes, they won't get them that way. The only way to get the mangoes, which are from trees planted by the Buddha, is to sit perfectly still under the mango tree. Open up your hand and a mango will fall in. And that was his simile. And I, couldn't, I thought that was crazy because by that time I knew mango trees. If you sat underneath one, you'd be sitting underneath for days before one fell. <laughs> and if it did fall, you know where it would probably fall? On your head. <laughs> Never in your hand. That was a crazy, stupid simile. What the heck did he mean? But of course, later on, when you stop trying to meditate, did some more letting go, finally clued into what the Buddha was teaching, stop, go against the stream of craving, you know, uh, let go, make peace, be kind, be gentle, is screaming at you from all angles. But you never did it until finally you decided, maybe give this a try, and stop chasing the carrot, sit perfectly still. Don't try and get so on. Don't try and climb the tree, shake the tree to make the fruits of insight fall. Just sit perfectly still and open up your heart. That's what open your hand was. And all these incredible experiences, they just fall. You don't shake the tree, you don't ask. You just sit still and open up your heart. And all these incredible experiences just come to you. And that's one of the most amazing things to, to notice and to experience. All these things you read about in the suttas. You just sit there perfectly still, not wanting anything in the whole world. Totally content. And all these nimittas and jhanas and paths and fruits, they just come. But you shake that tree, nothing falls at all. You climb the tree, you get just tired. Yeah, the only way Sit perfectly still. And wait in a moment. Don't say, I'm sitting still. Nothing's falling. I'm sitting still. Why isn't it falling? <laughs> that is not sitting still. That is expecting. Waiting in the future for something to happen. Sit perfectly still and open up your heart. And all these incredible experiences, they fall into you. Such a wonderful, brilliant story. Now you can see what you've been doing wrong. Well. Wanting something, trying to get something, trying to achieve something. Struggling, striving, putting forth effort. That's what the Buddha did for six years before he became enlightened. He said, don't do that. And now what do people do? Strive. Struggle. Be the tough guy, the tough girl. I'm as good as anybody else. I'm going to sit longer than anybody else. If you sit for long periods of time, is that going to make you enlightened? Another Rajan Chah story, he called that chicken meditation. <laughs> sitting for long periods of time. The reason he called it chicken meditation is because he noticed, being a boy from the village, that chickens sit for hours on their eggs without moving. 
And he said, if sitting for long periods of time without moving was going to make you enlightened, then all the chickens in the villages would be enlightened a long time ago. <laughs> so saying I sit for three hours, four hours, five hours, that's called chicken meditation. By <laughs> It doesn't matter just how long. Time is not important. It's a quality. What are you doing? Are you really making peace, being kind, being gentle? Are you really letting go? Are you being still? If you are, then that's meditation. Trying to get something is not meditation. So there we go. It is now time for uh, letting you go so I can have some lunch. <laughs> and again, I never chase lunch, I just stand there and it comes to me. <laughs>